Design Forum Series at SciArc. Uh, this evening, before we introduce tonight's speaker, I have a couple of statements to make. One, next Wednesday we will not have a lecture. Uh, Thanksgiving break. The following Wednesday, December 1st, will be the last speaker of the series, and that will be Kenneth Frampton, fairly well-known historian from New York. <laughs> Tonight, after the lecture, Lawrence Halpern, who is our speaker this evening, will, has an exhibit in our gallery, and we will be having an opening after the lecture. We'd like you all to come. Admission will be $2 for the general public and a dollar for visiting students, and wine will be served. Tonight, we have with us Lawrence Halpern, a multifaceted professional, well-known as an environmental designer, town planner, landscape architect, and filmmaker. Many of his works are around the United States. Some of those most well-known probably are Sea Ranch in Northern California. He also did Girardelli Square in San Francisco, where old buildings were recycled for new uses. The Fountain and Plazas in Portland, Oregon, which was very much involved with the humanization of city cores. He was involved in the Seattle, Seattle Freeway Park in Seattle, Washington. And he is currently working on the Roosevelt Memorial that was commissioned by the US Congress and on which he has been given the go-ahead. His published works include sketchbooks, process, taking part, and his notebooks, and the RSVP cycles. Mr. Halpern has also been recipient of many awards. Among those were the AIA Gold Medal for Distinguished Achievement in Allied Professions and the Gold Medal for the American Society of Landscape Architects. The films that Mr. Halpern has produced include The Pink Grapefruit on Salvador Dali that he did in 1976 and a film on the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. Both of those will be shown in the gallery during the Halpern Drawings exhibit beginning tonight, which will run through December 10th. As you can see, Mr. Halpern is a man of great depth, experience, and humanity. We are honored to have him with us this evening. Now that Barbara has given the lecture, I'm prepared to answer any questions. Um, thank you for coming, and I feel very comfortable in this room. I want you to know I I um, go to a lot of uh, schools and museums these days in which great monumental buildings have replaced buildings like this, and it always seems a shame because then what's left is is uh, what somebody else has done for the people in it leaving them no options about sitting in this way or modifying their environment or making themselves important in the building. And that seems to me to be a great loss. And so I'm, I'm glad to see this building and to, to sense the feeling that this school has and, and how the students are reacting to the creativity that, that seems to be coming here. Is that all true, by the way? I, I'm, just, I'm just emphasizing with it, I really don't know very much about the school, but I, I do get a sense of empathy about it. Um, I, I would like to talk this evening about a subject that has um, been more and more important to me as I've been uh, working in the last few years. It's a talk which uh, has been gradually coming about a series of slides which, as you know, are architects' security blankets as a method of avoiding commitment to words, which is a perfectly reasonable thing for architects and landscape architects and other people to do. Because through slides, of course, you can create poetic images which leaves the person who is viewing them as much option in, t in interpretation as you giving them, them yourself. So tonight's lecture is somewhat like that. I would like to show you a lot of images through slides of things that mean a lot to me and the process by which I work. And the words will go along with them, but I wish perhaps that you would have your own words for them. Um, I would like to go through this, the talk and the slides first, 
it's a new, in a, in a sense, a new subject for me, so I'm going to stumble a little bit. It's not precisely worked out. There will be some slides that I'm not going to be quite sure about what I'm going to say about them. Uh, if you have any questions of, of location of things, please to ask them while I'm talking. If you have questions, which I hope you do, about the ideas behind all this, uh, perhaps it'd be best to leave it for, for the end of the talk. Is that okay? And I hope that you uh, will stay and, and talk about them. Uh, we had anticipated a little bit that the, that the uh, exhibition would have been up for a few days, and therefore some of the things that I'm going to take about, uh, talk about tonight are revealed also in the, in, the, in the drawings, but that's okay too, I think. Uh, let's start with some of the slides. Um, the first, and in a sense, uh, the theme Thanks. Can you, can you manage that? Uh, the theme of, the, of what I'm going to try to say, can you see, can everybody see back there, by the way, are you, are you able to see? And, and can you hear what I'm saying back there? Yeah, good. The, the theme of what I have to say, in a sense, is revealed in this slide. Uh, it's uh, a media hype about architecture, uh, which I must confess for me is very disturbing, because it seems, uh, particularly since I've been in New York in the last few weeks, that New York, especially this part of New York, is beginning to violate all principles of humanity and what people on an archetypal and biological level really want in their environment. And the only thing that it is doing is making architecture and architects particularly a good copy for magazines. And therefore, to a certain degree, it seems to me that this is, in a sense, a violation of what the meaning and content and intention of architecture is about. And that is essentially what I'd like to talk about tonight, not the negative parts of it, but what is it that the building of places for human beings to live in and to be creative in and to live out a normal community life, normal in the sense that that norm, normal means creative and biologically sound. Uh, what is it that that might be and how would we go about achieving it if we're not achieving it as we might? Because that same slide down at ground level looks like this, where the Chippendale top, uh, the amusing uh, questions of facadism and stylistic mannerisms don't occur really. Uh, where I think I should be going into that, where in fact people live and move around and relate to their environment and are affected by it. And that's what real architecture is about. And here, in a sense, on the other end of the scale is a kind of bland environment that we also are surrounded with. Bland to the point that it is sweet, uh, almost nonsensical in its blandness, in the fact that uh, it, it doesn't impact us on an emotional level at all. And these kinds of things have, you know, we have begun to more and more understand how to make, how to do. Uh, they're all over Orange County. I must confess I can't remember where I took this slide, but I was astounded. Uh, the, by the way, the people, I th I'm not sure which of those are mannequins, to be perfectly honest with you, but, but um, some of them are and some of them are not, and it's very difficult to tell which is which. Um, I was down in, in uh, Orange County yesterday, and I was astounded at how many shopping centers occurred there. And I wondered about what, what it was, who, who was shopping in them all the time and so on. But anyway, here is the kind of environment that we have become more and more accustomed to. And I was in 
Native American country, Hopi country, the other day, which I want to talk about a little bit, and I found to my dismay that even there, the, um, the general level of environmental uh, destruction, in a sense, that that shopping center that we saw before represents is encroaching on Indian lands as well. This is a new shopping center in the Navajo country that has all the same kind of terrible implications that that other one did. And the question is, how can it possibly uh, replace the k kind of emotional intensity that people's relationship to their environment has developed in more primitive societies where the relationship to environment and dance and theater and art was so integrated that it formed the very essence of their lives, which, as far as I'm concerned, is how and why we make environments for people to be in. This is Walt on the second Mesa, no, first Mesa, actually, um, in Hopi country. And um, I was down there a couple of weeks ago, and although I've been down there before, I was struck again even more profoundly, partly because I knew that I was going to come, I suppose, to talk to you tonight, and I've been thinking a little bit about what I might say about this incredible relationship that people have had on a, on a profoundly nurturing basis uh, for where they live and how they relate and integrate all those aspects of the built and native environment that meld together into something which goes beyond and is more than an accumulation of each of its parts, where it, on a certain level, is what opera ought to be about, you might say but goes much deeper into it because it relates then back to religion and dance and theater. This is a drawing I made of the snake dance at Chungapovi, where for two days I was privileged, I felt, to witness the dance which starts by uh, eight days before by uh, the young men in the tribe going out into the mesa picking up rattlesnakes and other snakes, bringing them back in, uh, bringing them down into the kiva, praying over them, and then uh, finally uh, dancing with the snakes, which is a remarkable thing to see. They hear, this is a painting that I made of it, but here you can see how they hold the snakes in their mouths. Uh, it, the snake is a very complex kind of uh, relationship to many different levels of people's understanding about things, including the fact that ultimately at the end of these dances, rain should come, and that's what they're dancing about. They have, as you know, perhaps, uh, there's the carrier on the right-hand side, the one dancing with the snake, the one on the left is his assistant, uh, who is holding an eagle feather, and as the snake tends to start to strike, he, uh, he touches the snake. Uh, with the eagle feather, and again, as in many situations of this kind in many cultures, but this primarily of interest to us after all because these are where are our most primitive and, and important rights as a country come from. Um, the, uh, the snake is either stopped by the eagle from, uh, by the eagle stroking from striking or the mere fact that uh, he is held by the head prevents it from happening, but at all events he doesn't strike. And then they are brought into the center of the plaza, and mind you, all kinds of people are sitting around watching this happen. It's become, it, it has, it, they all, in a sense, be, become into a trance-like condition. And then they take the snakes up, and they bring them back to the mesa, and let it go out into the into the mesa, into the natural configura uh, configuration of the landscape, and then they take an emetic and vomit up any poisons that are in them, and then it rains. And it did rain, and it always rains. And the question is, why did it rain? Is it because they were so tuned in to the essential rhythms of the universe so that they could call up the rain? or? Do they do it at that time of year because it's going to rain anyway? And they have the good sense to know that, that you work with the gods rather than against them? 
All of those things are profound questions which I don't know the answer to, and I suppose nobody else does either. But at all events, we do know that here in this environment, with the Kivas and the places where they live, the next morning, the young bucks run up from the mesa, and there is an incredible quality of calling from the edge of the mesa down to the people who are running up. And you can hear the pollen shaking in the gourds because it's so quiet and the sun is rising and you can hear them stamping. And that quality of theater and religion and environment and architecture is beyond belief as far as I'm concerned because it is so touching and so poetic and so at the core of what we all are as human beings. And you have only to look at some of the architecture. I think Vincent Scully has pointed out that the forms of these buildings, this is an H, uh, this is in Taos, actually um, an apartment building, a condominium if you wish, uh, which has been in constant use for a thousand years and its relationship to the peaks is not fortuitous or gratuitous even. It's conceived of, it's thought of, and it relates to things and the Kiva too in its sculptural form are some of the great works of architecture and, uh, and sculpture related to how people also move down into them and carry out these things. Now, beyond that is how these pieces of architecture are used, how they come alive only when people are in them and activate them. That takes them out of the realm of sculpture, out of the uh, realm of just abstractions. It becomes then a piece of people's lives where the architecture and the town and the community only becomes activated and part of people's lives as they dance in them. I had a very wonderful experience the other day in this Pueblo, this is uh, Santa Clara. Um, some people who are good friends were explaining to me that they hadn't been moved from this Pueblo to some other place for all kinds of complex reasons during the time when the atom bomb was being uh, explored. And when they came back, I said, How, what was the most difficult thing for you when you came back as mature people because they had left when they were young? And they said, well, the difficult thing for them was to, to learn again how to dance. And that the most meaningful part of their lives as Indians, as American Indians, was how to dance because that was the way that they evoked all these profound feelings. And getting back into dance again was the most difficult, as part of their community life, was the most difficult for them to do. The same area, um, the scale of this is hard to believe. This is in, in a, a stone dome, like a bucky full of dome in a sense. Uh, Batatican ruins when the, where the Anasazi Indians lived, where again, this quality of, of how people lived, how they grew plants in the valleys where there was plenty of water, how security was important to them all uh, related together. And at that same level of integration with the natural landscape, not in a romantic sense at all, but in a very pragmatic and real sense, comes up over and over again, for me at all events, in the Navajo, uh, where this juniper, for example, is a grandfather, and the pinion pine is a grandmother. And in the morning, as any Navajo will tell you, if you get up and say hello to your grandfather and good morning to your grandmother, you're going to live for a long, uh, good life. And that relationship is a very profound one. It's a meditative one. It's a one that is uh, full of soul and s full of intensity, known not only amongst ourselves, but also amongst the Japanese, amongst the Ainu. There you can see a tree, which is a cryptomeria tree, which is treated on the same level, and that is that it is honored. Is, th is this light, by the way, bothering anybody? Should we turn it off? Huh? Does it matter? I can't hear you. No. OK. Um, that tree is honored by the rope, which is a blessing for it and signifies it as an important thing in people's lives. And then one step further where, as Jungians will acknowledge very readily, the profundity of the community and the art in the sand paintings, 
registering archetypal illnesses and solutions to people's issues becomes an integration of all these forms into something which is uh, beyond poetry, beyond psychology, and, and into religion and the origins of the world. This is an early sand painting, which, as you know, not only deals with, with design, but also how people live and how they came about to be. And in this incredible environment, um, where on a level which I find at all events, um, a, a kind of a intensity on an emotional level where I feel beyond comfort to the point where I feel tapped into origins of importance to me personally, uh, so that I'm very moved, and it seems to me at getting at the core of what people are about, uh, we enter with architecture. And that's a, that's a tough one, because this, the, the place that I showed you is that, that up there. Those, you can see some of the spars. And the most difficult question, I think, is how to, how to do it. And I want to talk a little bit about that, because this is a very functioning uh, motel. It's a Holiday Inn, I think. And uh, it has all the right things. It has some globes as light fixtures, and it, um, it has some trees, which some landscape architect, I suppose, has planted. And it has an American flag and a parking lot. And it functions extremely well. It's the only place for 100 miles that you can get a nice rest. But somehow, it does violate what's on beyond. Um, never mind Bob Venturi and, and looking at Las Vegas. Um, this, for me, seems a caricature of what might have happened. And, but the question is how to do it. And um, I want to explore it a little bit that way with you, because it seems to me as young people that should occur to you as one of the essences of what you're about. Again, never mind the facadism. What is the issue of how architecture or a built environment could enter into this negotiation with a magnificent landscape which is important to people and negotiate not a compromise but a, an additive uh, creative uh, environment that would enhance both? Uh, there are a few places in the world that have accomplished that. This is the same kind of an environment. It happens to be uh, in the hills below Jerusalem on the way to the Dead Sea, where perhaps one of the great places in the world was constructed. There's the Dome of the Rock, formerly Solomon's Temple. It's still a walled city. It's a place which at the other end of the world, but also in a profound way, people have identified themselves so much with the environment that the city and they are the same thing. As you know, uh, in the ancient words, Yemeshkachich Yerushalayim Tishkach Yemini, which says in biblical terms, if I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. Or, I am so identified with the stones of this city that it and I are the same thing. And on a community and uh, city level, this becomes so important as a place that when the Romans, this previous slide that I'm showing you is the gate to the city, one of the major gates. When the Romans came in, the main thing that they did immediately was to knock down all the walls, not because the walls were important so much as a defense mechanism, but because the walls, in a sense, were like the limbs of the body of the community. And then they did what in those days they used to do, aside from uh, making sacrifices, um, the head priest would, uh, the Roman priest would go around and plow a furrow down the walls uh, of the new city where the new walls were going to be, and then at each, and here you see him doing this, at each gate where the gate was going to be, he lifted the plow on his shoulder and went across the gate and then brought it down again in a ritualized and mythical way of delineating a city. And then there's the city inside. Um, if you remember back to that slide of the shopping center, and the difference between the emotional content of that 
uh, um, shopping center and this shopping center, think of the difference in terms of how people relate to it and what it means in their lives. On one sense, it's pure consumerism, double-knit suits. On this level, it becomes something way beyond that. It becomes a whole life and, an, and a way that people live. And um, the, the various religions live in here in great comfort with each other, in fact. And the stones, uh, these are some of the later stones, some of the early ones. It's always been amusing, to, uh, not amusing, but interesting to me to know that the lower stones, which are the biggest, are the oldest ones, when they have the least amount of technology to do that. And they get smaller and smaller as they go to the top. But this is one of the Turkish towers. Uh, it's a project that I'm working on. There's the western wall of um, Solomon's temple whose stones have become so meaningful to the people, no matter what the religion, in fact, that isn't really the issue. The issue is that people have so identified with them that the stones become images of themselves, of the very religion that they believe in, that the city and they are one, and that religion and environment becomes the same thing. And this sense of integration between them and it um, and themselves uh, is, is a profound one, and, and um, that doesn't only occur in, in the Navajo land and in Israel, but here in Zurich, the same kind of thing occurs uh, in those communities which seem to have a, a quality of selfness, of what they, of a, of a sort of persona, that uh, the, the next thing that seems important to me is how they use the city how it is used for rituals and festivals, how all kinds of people at certain times take off enough time to, to carry on activities of a public nature that relate themselves to the city. And uh, this is a festival for children that uh, I was very fortunate to be in, um, in Zurich during the time of. And the quality of this integration, again, was profound. And there it is at night. It went on all night. And uh, it, it revealed itself in many poetic ways. And so too do Japanese gardens, where captured in a small, intense space, surrounded by walls, with a borrowed landscape on beyond, are the essentials of all the things that we're talking about, where a few rocks, some sand, enclosure, sky, and some shadow patterns not only stands for what it is itself, but is in fact, after all, a metaphor for all of life. And this meditative quality, and you, you see there all of a sudden, I, I always perceived um, the Rianji Garden in Kyoto like this in the sense of its scale. It seemed endless, but then if you see it this way, which is really the scale that it is, it's quite small. It seems almost like a table landscape. But the reason I show these two slides is that here too, the, the young people, the students in Japan, go beyond religion almost when they come to this place. It has established itself as an imprint of a national character and a national value system upon them. This environment for them relating itself to universal forces of rock and sand and water e even, uh, the forces of nature brought together in a controlled landscape is a value system which for the Japanese has imprinted itself on everything they do. And so how, again, just to say again, how do we go about it? What, I'd, I'd like now to spend some time talking about some processes that have worked for me at all events, in how to capture some of these essential qualities in our own lives, and then how to transmute them into built environments comes more readily. One is, I find, to sensitize ourselves through all our senses, not only the visual sense, not only the intellectual sense, but all the senses, and that's all this drawing shows, uh, to what is there in the natural universe. And uh, this is a workshop. Uh, which I did a number of years ago and do very often up at the Sea Ranch in the Gualala River of 
a group of students from different parts of the world uh, who came here and for two weeks spent time up the Sea Ranch relating themselves to the environment. We do it on an awareness level where we go blindfold for a while and touch things and emphasize different senses so that people relate to things that are there in, in the world without wiping it out by the visual sense, which is the last sense that we came up with as a biological organism and is the most powerful one that we have in a certain way. The visual sense wipes out every other sense, but is no more important. It's not as primitive. And by closing our eyes and keeping them closed for a long extended period of time, you can relate yourself to things which you would other, otherwise not uh, be able to experience. And here, o over a long period of time, some of the students empathized so much that they became trees uh, in a mythological sense. And by becoming those things, as happens in more primitive cultures, amongst Indians, for example, when, when one does the buffalo dance, one is a buffalo. One is not dancing like a buffalo, one is a buffalo. And that empathy uh, was done here by Bill and here two down in the rocks amongst the surging surf, that same quality. And here in a different sense, this is Norma Lyskako, a, a brilliant dancer who here on this rock has become an extension, you might say, of the rock, or the rock has become an extension of her searching for ways to, to integrate that quality with herself so that it becomes part of her. And then we went on, and uh, this score was to build an environment, each one for themselves, without talking to anybody on a beach and not using any uh, material except what was there on the beach. And some of these uh, environments that people built were remarkable, not only because they were quite beautiful, but because they had profound implications, we discovered, for the people who built them. Uh, this actually is a faculty member, perhaps you know, some of you know, this Claire Cooper, um, and um, a, a, who has been working for many years recently. This was an early workshop that I did in post-construction analysis as an important way of looking at, at architecture. But here she was dealing with issues about herself, her family, as she explained it, and her two children. So that this is not only a beautiful environment that she built as a design, but this is another, uh, but also these had profound psychological relationships to how people felt. And the environment then released drives within them which went beyond just visual design or design itself, but became pieces of themselves externalized into the environment. And that, oddly enough, looks like that, uh, which is a universal symbol, almost a snake-like symbol, which maybe some of you may know, the Ouroboros snake, that that um, is used here in a healing dance by the, uh, by the Navajo healer um, and medicine man uh, with a patient who is sick. And the imagery is very similar in an interesting way. And here in our own workshop, the same image and people are discussing what it means to them and how it came about to be. And here you can see a, a gate-like figuration opening to the ocean, one of those important pieces of architecture that we tend to forget to an extent, and that is how can we relate ourselves through entrances and exits and the delineation of entrances and exits to some of the more powerful forces in the environment, such as the ocean, as uh, we have, to a certain degree, lost contact with, but the Japanese still do in their Tory gates. Now, I'd, some of you may say, well, was she copying a Tory gate? No, she was not. I'm not even sure that, that she was aware of what she was doing, because when she presented it, she had no reference to a Tory gate in Japan. It seemed in each one of these uh, in each one of these constructions that they became almost like dreams carried out into reality. 
and revealing things that were important. Here was a, this is a Maureen, and she uh, built this small environment and sat in it. And um, sat for quite a long while, and eventually sat long enough so that the tide came in and knocked it down. And there was some question in my mind as to whether she did that on purpose. And I asked, she said, no, not really, but maybe, maybe. And there she was, and she kept on sitting until it was destroyed. And when she, when she uh, shared with us what was going on, she said, well, you know, the fact is that what's just happened played out my relationship to my husband. <laughs> and although that, and at this remove may seem humorous, it really wasn't for her, because in fact, she was getting a divorce. And so you might say, how did that come about? Was it conscious? No, it wasn't conscious. But when she, when she spoke of it, it externalized and it came uh, to the surface, and this, this environmental event became very meaningful to her. Uh, so does uh, the environment of death in this which in our own culture tends to be somewhat swept under the carpet in more primitive cultures which are closer to biological uh, fun, uh, things in life. They ritualize the act of death. We did a, um, I'm sure you all know about the, um, about the art or science of geomancy which has to do with there are some wonderful books recently out on, the, on geomancy. The uh, feng shui, which the Chinese still use, is a form of geomancy, which is to say how universal forces of stars and heavens and universal energies affect how buildings and structures are created and how they should relate to the land, which the Chinese use, as you know. Here we were doing a form of geomancy in a workshop in which people were asked to go into this environment and find well, first a place that they would like to live in on that site, and the second is find a place that they like, would like to be buried in on that site. And then they shared, here are some of the actions. As you see, it, be, it was a very, very profound experience for most of them, as it has been for me as I've gone through this kind of an exercise. This relationship of how you feel about where you would live on a piece of land and how you would invest it with structures that uh, would enhance your life and then how you would feel about the same thing happening in death. We found an interesting thing which is revealed in these drawings and that is that the young people in this workshop spent a lot more time thinking about where they would want to spend their death period on this site much more than they did on the life part. And um, I never have quite figured out why it was so important to them, but they did. And it, as somebody has said, perhaps it's because they, they know that they'll be dead longer. But, uh, or it may be that it's a more profound experience. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Perhaps you'll think about that. But at all events, they're sharing this feeling with each other. And, and you can see the intensity of the, of the quality of it. Here's the death place. And then they made drawings. And this quality of where they were going to be in a high rounded hillside buffeted by wind, a limitless horizon, the sun setting rays, and that's the death place that was chosen. And that's a life spot balanced between a series of, of inextricable, inextricable forces and energies. Um, uh, we need the next, next uh, slide, uh, next tray please. Could, you, could somebody change that? And these workshops, uh, which I started, oh, I suppose, 15, 20 years ago, and have become more and more meaningful from my point of view about revealing deep-seated needs and desires that people have and lead thereby to design uh, revelations to people on a creative level which seem profound and not just superficial, have become more and more important to me and seem to me a way of coping with many of the questions that I raised at the beginning and that you are, I'm sure, confronting as you're working uh, in, in learning and, and becoming uh, more and more able to produce and, and create environments for people to live in. Um, these workshops are an incredibly um, forceful and uh, um, revealing kind of a process if they're done 
uh, on a creative level. Uh, this is one environment that uh, I'm now going to try to deal with a little bit with some environments that I've worked at and how some of these forces and ideas and ways of working have helped me at all events work with them in molding them to human use and need on a community level often. Uh, this is the Sea Ranch, which uh, has been for me one of the most interesting things I've ever attempted to do because what I tried to do was take 11 miles of the coast and make it into something beyond what was there, but what was there was incredibly beautiful and how to make a place where people could live with the natural landscape, enhance their lives through it, and not destroy what was there uh, by their being there, uh, which is a very difficult thing to do, uh, was the task that uh, we assigned ourselves. And that's the, the natural landscape and the forces uh, that are constantly at work, uh, the sun and the wind and the tides, uh, and we, early on, these were some of the early ecological studies that we did, uh, how the wind uh, worked and how it was affected by both the landforms that were there and how you could place uh, houses in the lee of the wind and therefore protect yourself and how the houses could be in fact designed so that the wind uh, was removed from the, from the lee of the, of the house where you could be then protected and facing south and so on. All those forces were taken into consideration and the buildings and, and uh, configurations of the landscape that we developed there were patterned after those scientific studies which then became part, like Feng Sui, uh, of the universal forces that got us going. Here too is a painting I made of the forces in the natural landscape that have to do with process of animals, kelp, how the kelp breaks up and how the, how the rocks have been formed and how the cormorants fly all of which you might say, some of which uh, helped put the houses in the right place so that they didn't get swept off to sea and so forth. But there were much more profound things that it revealed to, to us on a spiritual level uh, that had meaning as we worked into uh, built environments that, uh, that would be helpful for people's lives. And here at, at the end was an overall, what I called a locational score which revealed where the buildings were to go, how they were put to be placed, what the land coverage was, and, and uh, one of the major things that we did was to develop a T-shape where the commons areas tapped way up into the ridged areas so that people could drift down to the ocean front and as against Malibu and other places which have been built entirely differently, no structures occur along the edges of the cliffs so that all people can use those and hiking trails and so forth remain and views are allowed through and the whole community then has the option of using all the parts of the natural landscape and uh, the houses are clustered together leaving vast areas of commons. It's an interest, it's a simple idea. It's very often hard to carry out. Uh, these were some diagrams of different kinds of clustering, linear clusters, tight clusters, uh, party wall um, clusters and the point was never uh, just to make the buildings butt against each other or be clustered but what would happen as a result of that as in farms and small villages in particularly the hill countries of, of Europe or even in the farm country of our own United States seemed as a model that was important and there are some of the actual structures which related both to the to the pitch of the wind and also uh, to this clustering effect. That is a cluster that, uh, the first cluster that we built designed by Moore Turnbull, um, which um, because of all these uh, studies, uh, as you can see, not only allow lots of open space, but also in a sense become a part of the landscape. It isn't a part in a romantic sense. It's uh, because it has its own integrity, its own uh, strength as a piece of architecture, but somehow it has the same kind of process quality, it seems to me, as the rest of the landscape. And the re reason for that, I, I believe, is not only that they were very talented architects uh, who finally put form to it, but also because the process had the same integrity as the processes that made the rest of the landscape. And um, 
since I believe that to be true, um, I always constantly in my own work look at the beginning primarily and, and then hopefully continue all the way through for what is the process by which I am designing something. Uh, not only as a person, but in, in congruence with a lot of other people and, and in terms of what's there and how the people are going to use it and, and all of that. And then I feel comfortable about what's going to happen. This is a, a plan of a piece of the, a piece of the uh, sea ranch and uh, it happens to be actually the piece that I have the good fortune of being able to be on a lot and uh, the structures there too. Uh, grew into this piece in a kind of a organic way of growing out of all these forces and uh, is therefore, in my view, a, a remarkable place to be. Uh, wherever we have been successful there, naturally, in anything there have been non-successes, but wherever we've been successful there, it seems to all of us that we've enhanced what was there and made more than had been there through this process rather than destroying it. And we put certain configurations on requirements for people amongst them, uh, which we've had a lot of dialogue about recently. One of them is that we use only material which will weather well and therefore not, um, not require attention from anybody. Do you follow that? That's opposed to what most architects would like to do. Most architects would like to have people pay attention to what they've done. Uh, I leave it up to you. Perhaps in a city that's okay. In certain, in certain situations, it seems to me that that is not true. Here we took the position that we wanted people to be aware of the architecture but not have to look at it. And therefore, the use of materials that would do that uh, chose a lot of what we were going to do. In addition to that, uh, it's hilly and therefore you look down on roofs and therefore tar and gravel seemed an erroneous kind of material and therefore the pitches had to be 4 and 12 and so on and on. There was an organic configuration of built up requirements which, which uh, modified and molded what the architecture was. And here uh, a demonstration of how through the use of natural um, natural landforms, which took care of some important winds that are coming from the northwest, uh, siting in a certain way, use of certain materials, a an outdoor environment which is protected and warm and sunny and is used. And here is a, a group of people up in that area relating to it in some ways the way uh, that uh, the Native Americans relate to their environment through uh, dance and theater in that environment. Not for, not for visitors to, to see, but for, them, for themselves. And therefore, it becomes a ritualized form of theater, which is for externalizing internal feelings as a group of, of people, rather than, uh, rather than a theater for others to become. And that, in this environment, has meant for me over the years, uh, here are some sketches and drawings of the various things that have come up. And a, here, is the meaning for me of this particular piece that I'm showing you, and that is that what, as I go up there each weekend, or when I go up there, what I perceive in the environment. And what I perceive in this environment is all those things that all these workshoppers have engaged in on an integrated level of art and environment over the years with my presence there. And that's what's unique to me about that environment much more than the built form that we've made ourselves uh, to encase ourselves with. Do you follow that? Could somebody say whether you're with me or not? Yeah, okay. I'm not asking you to agree. I just hope you're following what, what I'm trying to say. Here are some structures that were built uh, in that environment uh, relating themselves to what's there. And again, what happened is um, interesting. This was a workshop score which said, move on to this beach without talking with each other, make a, a community that will work for this group of people who are there for the day. And uh, there were 20 of them, and 
the interesting thing about it was that the first thing they built was a center pole to signify the center of the community. And the second thing they did was to build this, which, that was that, the, build this, which had, had apparently became their temple. Uh, they then built individual environments for, each, for themselves, and uh, some of them uh, got into the environments with each other, and uh, therefore established relationships, roles with each other. And then they linked it with paths and sequences of small paths linked to each other, which in many ways differentiates early settlements from later settlements. Our, late, uh, our most technological se settlements up till now have had the strongest linkages with each other, whereas the most primitive ones, which are more like animal um, communities, perhaps relating to biological needs, are structures which are linked by very thin links. And this one, which this is a drawing of, was of that kind. And here, too, there, <coughs> they, uh, this is a drawing of certain places in that environment where rituals occurred, theater occurred, and over and over again, the same thing seems to come up, where in these rocks, uh, certain places are occupied as a place for power. Some places are used as places for two people to be together. Some are used as places for several people together. The environment itself seems over and over again, uh, with new groups coming into the same place. The environment seems to generate many of the same attitudes amongst people, which leads me to believe that there are in essential universal qualities between this person environment relationship that are universal and ubiquitous and come up over and over again, and therefore they much, must be emotionally and contextually sound, and therefore they're worth tapping into. That was a long statement. Did you, did you follow it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and here, you, you, you'll be interested in this. This was a group of students from UCLA a couple of years ago. There's Charles Moore with a bald head. And, um, and um, this group did a very interesting uh, environment in the same kind of a score for them, which was quite different from the others. And here, the first thing they did was to grid off the site. which uh, one can look at in a charitable way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in England and, and many places in the world, there are, what are those called again, those grid lines that uh, people are from? Does anybody remember the name of the gr big grid lines that were established in prehistory? What? No, but they're, what? That's it, ley lines. Ley lines, thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, in England, uh, there are ley lines all over um, the British Isles, and they occur in primitive, and people are beginning to make studies of those, and they seem to be early people's ways of relating themselves to the forces of the, of the heavenly bodies. And one can be, one can be uh, charitable and assume that that's what these are, or you can simply say that no architect in his right mind will tackle a difficult problem like this without gritting it off. <laughs> I mean, you know, whichever. <laughs> and anyway, that's what they did, and then they did a remarkable thing, which is that. And uh, that blew my mind, actually. They did this without talking, and, um, and without a dialogue about what they were going to do, some working together, and again, it has all, I think that is just beautiful. And uh, it has all the things, you know, here's a stream that was running through and they made a place uh, for it, which you might say is either temple or, uh, and then there is the, the movement out into the long space, and then on beyond is perhaps either the great burial ground or the big great church, whatever you want to think of it, but, in many ways, this has all qualities of Peking or uh, other, or Thebes or, uh, or other magnificent spots in the world which have attempted in real materials, if you want to call them that, to structure the environment and yet relate to it. Now, I want to show you this because this is really quite interesting. There is no known reason for anybody to have done that. Um, 
uh, nobody there knew why they did it. Um, uh, this was a way, uh, with a different group, by the way, of moving into one of those environments and actually using it. The interesting thing to me, the, this was a group of dancers and theater people, and they used their environment for song and dance. The architect stood around and photographed it. <laughs> but, um, but to get back to the other point, which, but this is an important point, uh, because, in a sense, this and that are the same. And they come from the same place, they come from the same need, and they resolve many of the same problems. Uh, but to get back to this one, um, they, the people in the workshop then came back to my studio and they made this drawing of that uh, thing and that environment and they also did this without scales or without any talking and afterwards I dimensioned and it was exact. It's really a remarkable uh, thing to have done but look at that spiral again and then look at this spiral. You see, and this is uh, five miles long in Ohio and is um, early in pre prehistory Indian uh, mounds that uh, some and pieces of it are bare as you can see, but it comes from that and it starts with that spiral again, the spiral vortex going down counterclockwise and clockwise, depending on which hemisphere you're in, is a universal symbol which cropped up again in the other one, and uh, presumably because. It's a universal symbol that people use over and over again, and I show you this because I have not, without, without really thinking about it too much, have used the same spiral in a Holocaust memorial that I'm designing, uh, which takes on the same configuration and probably for the same reason. It's a, it's a memorial to the dead and has um, intensity of emotion which uh, spirals as a mythical configuration tend to do. And so uh, I say that not to show you this so much as to say that, that um, tapping into some of those universal uh, images and symbols that we all are invested in in our subliminal, subliminal consciousness is a way of thinking about how to design as well, not only in that but uh, in many other ways. And I want to go on and say this is not just impractical and utopian, but many of these same attitudes have usefulness. And I'm using the word usefulness in quotations. That is, you can use them for a pragmatic real life situation. Uh, and uh, if you wish, uh, here is a small community up in the Ma Napa Valley who came to me one time and wanted us to, to design for them a community plan because they were very worried about about uh, the influx of tourism and large numbers of people beginning to think that their community was wonderful and so moving in and destroying the very thing that, the, that they liked about it. You, you follow that one, we do that all the time. And um, so they came and they asked, and so I said, okay, we'll do that, but let's have a workshop about it because in developing a workshop, it will allow you people in this community to articulate the things that you really want, not what you think you want, and uh, become part of the process of designing, and this was a long while ago, and so we did some awareness walks, and then they went into the Grange office, uh, Grange house, and together in groups started making images after their awareness walks of what, in fact, they thought they would like for their community, and it was an incredible way. These are, everybody starts by saying they can't draw, and it ends up that they can draw beautifully, you know. Because when they forget about the fact that they can't draw, they draw in the same way that, uh, that you walk. Uh, if you think a great deal about walking, you can't walk very well. Just a second, I'm gonna take my jacket off. Anyway, they started with this workshop and went on. One of the senior citizens had been a, a cartoonist and he did this one about Wake Up Yountville and then the, um, uh, the Girl Scouts made drawings of what they thought the community ought to be. 
and uh, kids of all sizes and shapes participated. And then the, perhaps the most interesting thing was that at the, there are many, many, uh, as you might know, many, many weekends that this happened over. And they all said at the end, look, we know that architects always like to make master plans, but uh, we know that if we make a master plan, put a big report together, we'll put it on the mayor's desk and that'll be the end of it. So what we're going to do is do plays about uh, theater pieces. This was their idea of what the master plan means. And so there were four plays of four different options. And by making them in dramatic form, which each one took about 10 minutes, where one of them was the venal, venal developer just out for the quick buck, you know, that kind of thing. And the other was the utopian uh, young person. The other one was somebody who was growing pot up in the hills and, and uh, and so on. Uh, by doing that, they were able to symbolize and, and make obvious the things that uh, most planners take, you know, 100 pages to do. And they understood it very clearly. And the next day, they quickly came to the decision of which option they wanted. And this is a real life story. And now they're carrying that, that plan out. Uh, this is another community which did exactly the same thing. And I show you this because through that process, all of these places have begun to be invested, and this is, I guess, the meaning of what I'm telling you about, begun to be invested with some of the imagery and symbolism and the intensity of how, in earlier times, over long periods of time, people grew into this relationship to their environment. And it, ha it happens in the same way through many of these same processes. That's the main street of a town. It, okay, maybe. But they didn't want that, and this is what they changed it to. Uh, very simple. Uh, and, and this was a year later, and there's, if you don't.